Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's understand system design or software architecture for Pastebin or text sharing websites. First we need to understand the functional and non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements as in all the behavior of your software architecture and the functional requirements are the business requirements. So the business requirements are first one, obviously a user should be able to paste the text and share to other users by using a customized link or auto-generated link. So that's the first requirement. And also there's a limit of maximum text size should be 10 MB. This is usually your business requirement and business requirements will drive the system design. So it's very important to properly uh, gather all the business requirements. And the second one is user should be able to have his own custom URL. Say if you have a domain of uh, say pastebin.com, user should be able to give this part and obviously when the user visits to that specific path um, the same text should be up here and the next one is paste expiry so by default the business requirement let's assume the paste should expire after six months uh, but user should be able to customize that as well and the fourth one is user should be able to log in and see all of his uh, specific pastes or uh, if user is not logged in, you should uh, try to uh, you know aggregate or attach those paste to an anonymous user created for that specific session or a browser where you have dropped your cookies. And the next thing is understanding the non-functional requirements. So the non-functional requirements for pastebin.com is first one is durability because once you write that data, it should be always be there. It's not like you write the data to the system like pastebin.com and then when you visit that link, the data is not found or something. Those those errors shouldn't be there. So the system should be 100% durable. And the second one is high availability. And the third one is low latency. It means that you should be able to access the paste uh, using this URL as fast as possible with very low latency. So the easiest way to uh, uh, find out the non-functional requirements is take a look at 12 quality attributes of system design and you will be understanding much more. Some examples are testability, maintainability, uh, reliability, fault tolerance. All of these are the non-functional requirements. You can add them uh, to make it much understandable. So now let's understand the capacity estimation. Three things to derive. The first one is traffic. The second one is data estimation. So the third one is the network estimation. So let's uh, define the traffic. Before that, we need to come up with some assumption. When you're designing system, you need to understand what will be the usual traffic for your system once you have the system ready. So let's assume that there will be 100k users per day who is creating new paste on our site. So and also assume that if you look at this pattern, uh, there it's the system looks like more of read heavy because um, once I paste the content onto my site, I might be using the site link uh, to access that paste often and often or maybe I'm sharing with my friends or some others. So it is more of a read heavy. So if 100K writes are happening or 100K pastes are creating in a system, there could be possibility that it is read 10 times on an average. So the reads will be 100K into 10. So that will be like 1000K. Uh, so using that uh, assumption, let's understand what is the traffic. So let's calculate for the writes. For the writes, what happens is we know that 100K um, per day um, writes will be happening. So per hour, it will be divided by 24. You'll be getting about 4,166 writes per hour. So per second, it will be equal to 150 per second. All you have to do is assumption divided by 24 or divided by 24 by 3,600 seconds in an hour. So it will be 150. So similarly for reads, what we have to do is it is 10 times more. Okay. So into 10, you will add one more zero K. So this will be the number of reads per day. And then per second, if you want to calculate, we'll have to divide it by 24 by 3,600. And whatever the number it comes up will be the reads per second. It will be obviously 10 times more means it will be 115 to 10. So it will be around 1,500 reads per second. So this is the expected read traffic to your system. So whatever you design should be able to easily handle this one. Obviously, always keep a buffer of about 20 to 30 percent. So buffer is about 30 percent. That could be means that you might get 30 percent less traffic or your system should be able to handle uh, 30 percent more traffic as well. Um, means that we have to design our system maybe approximately to meet uh, 1000, uh, 30 percent of 1500 um, is what uh, around 400 plus or something. So 
let's round off this to around 200, um, sorry, 2000 requests per second is our read. Uh, and the writes would be, let's round off it to maybe 200 uh, writes per second, something like that. So let's understand data storage capacity estimation. So we have to make a little more assumptions here. Our business requirement said that we can store a maximum of 10 MB of paste text data in our system, but not that every user will upload that much of data. That's the max limit, but most of the users might upload even less or some might upload 10 MB max or it could be. So we have to draw a middle line number on average, on an average, how much the data the, uh, every user will use it. Uh, it would come around 10 KB. It's up to you how you want to derive an average. So I'm just uh, deriving it something uh, lower ballpark. Uh, so it would be like, so let's assume that 100 KB of data on an average every user will uh, update um, in a day or in a year. So that leaves us to estimation. So on a, we have to do two estimations, the worst case uh, storage and the average case. On the worst case is if we store, if every user stores 10 MB of data, and in a day, if we are receiving about 100K writes, then how much data we are going to store? So that will lead up to about 1000 GB data per day. And the second one is average data consumption. In this case, 100 KB of um, uh, users on an average, um, 100 KB of data uh, for all the users on an average in a day and 100K writes. So that would give up to about 10 gigabytes of uh, data storage per day. So what does it say? And why it is important is because based on these numbers, we can decide what kind of database we can use. Um, if you look at uh, if in a day we are saving about, uh, on a worst case, 1000 gigabytes of uh, data, in a year it will be coming up to 365 days into 1000 GB. So it would be looking like 365 uh, terabytes of data in a year. So if you have, uh, if you have plans to run for longer duration, like 10, 15 years, that would easily give an estimation of how much data you're going, your system is going to store on a worst case. But the worst case looks uh, really credible or incredible. It's just 10 GB per day. It's okay. So these numbers will help you to decide what kind of database do you want to use it for your system and what is good. So you can uh, use SQL or NoSQL. Uh, if you use NoSQL now, a lot of things are automatically taken care. Uh, let's see how we can do that in future. Uh, the second thing is, so suppose if the user is storing 10 MB of the data, do we really need to store that information in the database itself? Do we offload that information somewhere in a data storage like um, uh, S3 or Azure cloud data storage or somewhere? And then do we only say the reference or the URL to that blob in the you know, S3? Uh, that's one strategy. So if, if we go to that strategy, um, what's, what are the problems? So if you save everything in the DB, it's much simpler because you don't have to make external calls because once you make the query, you will get back the data. But the, there are a lot of problems with that. So if you are making a lot of queries to the database uh, and along with the query, you're getting too much of data back in that query itself. That means the, the, the database IO should be really high because you are doing too much of uh, network, uh, consuming too much of network. Um, so one way to solve is, as we discussed, we can offload the blobs to the um, storage. But is it worth to offload everything? If the data size is very small, then do we need to? So we can do a hybrid approach where if the data size is uh, less than the average, then let's store that information along with the data entry uh, for the paste in the as a blob. If it is crossing more than the average consumption, then what we can do is we can upload it to S3 and then uh, we can save the link to that S3 um, in the database. But is that enough itself? Because if you look at the caching strategy, we are going to discuss in the future, but let's just for the information. Uh, can we cache all of this uh, 10 MB of data in our caching servers? Because we know that the write to read ratio, according to our assumption, is uh, 1 is to 10. So when there are one write happening, there could be that possibility that there are 10 reads. That means that potentially we will have to cache this. Uh, maybe uh, we are caching after second request, uh, then we will be optimizing, uh, we are reducing eight writes, uh, or sorry, reads to our DB. So uh, our DB will be much healthier. 
Um, so we need to cache. If we add caching, the problem is, can we cache all the 10 MB of data in the Redis itself? That would be a huge problematic. Um, if we don't cache it, user will see a lot of latency because by the time you download from S3, it takes a little more time to render. So what we can do hybrid approaches in your database record. Um, so you're going to store, if your data is crossing more than average, you're going to store the S3's link as well and also just some 100 KB of data also. Why, uh, if you have 100 MB, you're just storing a little bit of data also in the database uh, along with the S3 link so that when the user queries, you can initially show this preview text on his page so that the user will be uh, having some data to look at it. And in the background, you can make a call to S3 and load the remaining data. So that's like adaptive approach where you show some preview of the data and then in the background you're fetching the complete information from S3 and then show it. Uh, if your data is less than the average, then you're obviously not storing uh, in the S3. Everything is present in the database row itself so you can directly show it to them. So this way caching is also much better um, and also we can efficiently utilize S3 or any data storage, distributed data storage to store the big blobs. So the next thing to understand is database schema. In this case, we need two different tables. The first one is user and the second one is the paste uh, information uh, table. In the user table, we'll be obviously need four different fields, ID, name, created, and some metadata information if you want to store. So every time when the user is logged in, you'll be creating one entry for that user and in this respective name of the user. Otherwise, you'll be creating an anonymous user and you still refer that user by uh, some, some ID for that user and that user will not have a name, uh, will not have a name or any other information. So this is just needed to show all the created pace from that particular session so that even if he refreshes, he can at least see all the paste uh, he created without logging in. So that way we can still have some references of who created all of these pastes. So the next thing is we need paste table. This obviously will have a paste ID and the content the, the interesting thing is, as we discussed, if you go for hybrid approach where if you are saving some uh, the content, if only if the data is less than 100 KB, uh, in that case, maximum we need uh, this column to be of 100 KB. Uh, only 10, 100 KB varchar is more than enough. And then the S3 link where if the data is more than 100 KB, uh, that means that we are going to store the S3 link or the object ID of that um, uh, blob uh, in here. Otherwise, uh, created date and um, is, is needed when the paste is created. And the next thing is expire at. This is by default set to six months. Otherwise, if the user configures to some other information, we can store that here. And you guys uh, fill in whatever the data types and size, and then you calculate all of that um, when you're calculating the data estimations also. So what kind of database to use? As we discussed earlier, we can use RDBMS or NoSQL. In case of NoSQL, we can go for MongoDB because it is truly consistent uh, database as well. Um, and also you can use RDBMS. In that case, you will have to partition by user ID or something like that. So you can linearly keep on scaling whatever the data we are receiving every day. Um, and one more thing uh, is people usually think that why can't we just use Redis uh, where we can store all of this information against a simple key, maybe a paste ID and all of this information. You can do that and it is also high performant. The thing is you'll be end up paying a lot of money to your um, cloud provider because everything is stored in the RAM and RAM is too costlier. So on and uh, overall uh, Redis is too much costlier compared to the database uh, because database is disk oriented. And now here is the system design diagram for Pacepin and uh, how it is designed on the rise plane. So two way you can do that. One using serverless. Okay, this design is totally uh, written thinking it as a serverless design, but you can do by using your virtual machines or containers as well. So in this case, I'm using API Gateway uh, because these are serverless. Uh, say in case of Amazon AWS, it will be considered as Lambdas. We don't need too much of, uh, of backend functionality here. Apart from, uh, if you look at the APIs we need, one is the right API for, for the paste and one more API to read that paste, whatever it is written to the system. Apart from that, you can have other APIs like user specific, like user creation uh, API or update API, all of that. So now what happens here is the API gateway receives the request from the user's browser or application. 
and then it is going to invoke as many serverless functions it needed. So you don't have to really worry about scaling and all of that. But if you don't want to in, uh, use serverless uh, strategy, what you can do is you can have as many containers here. Uh, you can maybe use Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or something like that. The idea is you will be having those many containers or servers or EC2 containers or EC2 um, instances, whatever it is. So you'll be having those many. Um, um, in, in that case, most likely your read and write uh, pay, uh, uh, functions will be in the same uh, code base. So any containers or any virtual machines or um, EC2 instances can handle both thing. So in this case, I just wrote it separately because those are serverless functions. So when the request comes in, it is going to invoke um, those many, um, so those many lambdas or functions, and those will take care of writing the data into the database over here. And these databases are partitioned by user ID. And this is a range partition where uh, initially you'll be having only one, say for example, if you had designated the range from one to maybe one million, until uh, it reaches from one to one million, all the data rights will be going in here. And you will be always having a you know way of monitoring that you always have 50% extra space available in your system. So once you know that there is, it has filled up by 50%, you always keep provisioning the extra database and then keep assigning the next ranges for the partition. So the, the rights always kind of keep going on to one database. And since our rights are like um, 150 to 200 rights per second, these databases can easily handle. Uh, if it is NoSQL, already it would have been in a ring configuration or it is already distributed, so the rights will be automatically going there. Um, so this is what it is. Um, if you want to de design it as a microservices, then definitely uh, your one container or a couple of containers or EC2 instances will be taking care of only the rights of paste and then creating, and those will be connecting to this database. And there could be one more microservice which basically reads all of uh, the uh, uh, paste which are pasted into the database when the read request comes in. So the other thing you need to uh, look at over here is we have used memcached as well because we want to cache some of the um, pastes which are frequently accessed. As we earlier discussed that um, the read versus write ratio is 10 is to 1. So, so if there is one write happening, that most likely 10 reads are happening in parallel. So the we have to scale this section more than this one. Um, if it has uh, serverless functions, then you don't need to really worry about it. So they will be automatically created. But if it was EC2 instances or virtual machines, so if you have maybe one instance of this, maybe you need uh, 10 of them, but it is not always straightforward. You will only figure out when you do the load testing outside of that. So in case of uh, caching here, first what happens is that when the request comes in, you will check in the cache if that value or key value presence, then if, you, if it's there, you don't need to query the database and then you can just get it and then return it. If there is a cache miss, then the request will go to the database and get it back and then cache it over here and then return it back. And also one thing you need to see over here is it is also replicated. Since we know that memcache is um, is very good uh, in uh, performance because it's multi-threaded unlike Redis. Um, so we want high performance over here and also it supports clustering. So we have multiple nodes in this cluster and all of them are replicated. Um, so you don't lose the data as well. So you don't you most likely once you write the data into the cache, um, most likely you will not uh, you'll not be getting the cache miss. And also one more strategy we discussed uh, to optimize the caching is because cache is costly, uh, right? So the other optimization we discussed already is if the data is more than 100 KB, the average size, then we are going to upload all of that data into the block store here. It could be S3 or it could be anything on the cloud. Uh, which is a distributed store for the blob. So we also store a little bit of uh, preview data into the database and the, all of the data will be stored in here and that URL will be recorded into the database. And when the user accesses it, so you can get the entry of preview of 100 KB data um, and all the other information, send it back here by the read API and the complete information can be queried from the S3 over here and then you will have the complete data over here. And the next thing uh, you need to understand is uh, the freedom of uh, choosing the length here. Unlike it's uh, unlike the system, this is not uh, really a URL shortener because a lot of I've seen a lot of documents, a uh, lot of um, articles in the internet. They all refer uh, it is something similar to um, you know uh, URL shortener. But 
maybe a little bit is true, but not everything because here uh, a lot of things changes here because we don't always uh, we don't have a constraint of choosing a very short key here. We have the freedom of choosing any length, but it's always advised to use short one. So consider if we just use about um, 10, uh, 10 character length paste identifier, then we have the freedom of if we choose all the 64 characters like um, A to Z, um, small letter A to Z, 1 to 10 and the special characters, whatever it is. So you'll, you'll obviously have 64 of, uh, character freedom. So it rises to the power of uh, 10 character, whatever that number is, it will be definitely in billions. So you will never run out of these random um, text to choose it for the paths. So, um, so but but the, the thing is, who will create these keys and how these unique keys are referred? Um, one strategy is let the database create the keys for you itself. But the problem with that is the databases will usually create, uh, you know, uh, keys serially. That means that the numbers are from one, two, three, four, something like that. That is more predictable. We don't, uh, we don't want users to able to predict the paste. Say, for example, if we use the database key directly itself, our first created paste bin will have the URL, something like dot com slash one. And the next one will be two, three, four, five, six, something like that. But uh, user, so any hacker can easily, ha not just hacker, anyone can easily predict the paste so they can keep on incrementing the number and then keep on reading whatever random text. So we don't want that. So we want to have uh, this one of always equal length and unpredictable. So we can't just let database create those for us. So we'll have to manage uh, to create that one. So one easy strategy is let this API itself create a random number and try to insert the information which we want to uh, insert into the database with that randomly created string of a certain length. Then if that key is not already present in the database, then obviously the write will be successful because we will be having the unique constraint for the, for the primary key or ID of the paste. So it will go through. If it raises duplicate error, that means that that key is already used, then we will have to recreate or uh, regenerate a new random key and then try to write it. And then if it succeeds, fine. Otherwise, we'll have to come back and then recreate and then write it. Uh, this is easier because I have seen some of the comments in my previous video that uh, in case of URL shortener, that why are we using Zookeeper for creating the ranges of IDs? Why can't we just do this way, like creating the random uh, string, try to write if it is already existing, then we will create one more and then keep on writing. The problem with that strategy is the uh, when you have already utilized a lot of random keys, most likely that you will be um, creating random string strings, which could be potentially um, clashing the existing, um, which could be potentially clashing with the existing key, which is in the database. So we don't want that. The reason is simple because we will usually have an SLA of, okay, we are going to uh, com complete this write request in certain specific time. Say our SLA says that uh, we are going to finish this write maybe in say 200 milliseconds. In that case, all of the APIs most likely should be uh, finishing in 200 milliseconds. But if you look at this case, when we are randomly creating in this API and then writing into the database, sometimes if there is a cache, uh, sorry, Sometimes if the keys are colliding or there is a clash, that means that we'll have to come back and then create one more and then write it again, keep on writing, writing it again. So that way we spend most time over here doing that operation. So our uh, APIs cannot uh, complete uh, compliant to the SLA, uh, to the service level agreement. So then what happens is Sometimes the APIs will be faster and sometimes the API will be slower. When there is an ID clash, that means that the APIs will be taking more time to figure out the next one and then try to write. So this is not really a good way of doing it. So our system should be always be predictable. And um, so that's the reason why we also need to have one more service which actually generates keys for us. So that way we don't really need to worry about uh, generating the key, checking into the database. Uh, is it clashing with the already stored data or not? Um, and, and then figure out one more and do that. So our key generation service will take care of that work for us. What we have to do is maybe make an RP, RPC call or something from our uh, Lambda function or your EC2 instance to ask for a keys, um, unused keys. This service will basically uh, would have already generated a lot of keys ahead 
maybe we'll be having multi-threaded uh, operations here. So one thread will be keep on generating a lot of keys for us. And the other thread will be serving back uh, the keys to the all the services which are requesting for. All the generated will be, keys will be stored in the Redis and it is also distributed so that we don't lose those keys. And we have a track of what keys are used and what's not. And if you look at this, even if you have billion number of keys, the memory which we need is very less. Uh, say if we have 10 character, okay, 10 characters into maybe whatever this number comes up to, even if it is like 100 billion, whatever. So it would never cross more than like 100 GB. And this is very negligible uh, considering that we just need 100 GB of uh, Redis uh, storage to uh, for our key generation service. So that way there is a service which automatically generates keys for us and all of the uh, the right APIs will be keep on asking the key generation service to give a unique key and then take that key and then keep on writing. Or maybe to optimize uh, these servers may be requesting for hundreds of uh, you know keys at once and this service will mark all of the hundred has uh, used and then this service will be keep on using those hundreds of uh, keys at once and then once those are over they will be keep on asking the uh, key generation services uh, that way we can reduce the number of calls coming to the uh, you know, distributed key generation service over here and this distributed distributed key generation service is also replicated so you can have master master or master slave like architecture over here uh, is just very simple if this machine is down maybe this I will talk to this one because all of the data will be present in the Redis and this is already distributed and persistent so we don't really need to worry about it. it's not too complex to implement over here and the next thing to understand is how the distributed key generation service will generate that random strings this design is taken from Twitter snowflakes where Twitter used to also have a distributed key generation service uh, to generate the keys for their tweet uh, tweets uh, because they used to use Cassandra as the database and uh, Cassandra at that time doesn't use to support uh, the um, auto incremental ID for the um, new records or the rows to be inserted in the in, into the table. So what they used to do is um, distributed key generation will uh, generate a keys for those tweets and that will be unique and those keys will be used as the primary key for those tweets. And the same concept we can use it here. This distributed key generation service will be keep on generating a lot of keys for us. We can have two threads over here and one thread will basically takes care of providing uh, the keys to the any any service which asks uh, to provide the keys. Um, and the other thread, what it does is it keeps on generating these keys um, and then storing it in the Redis and marking them as not used. Okay. So that way, the other thread, when they want to provide the keys, uh, they can check in the radius that whether this key is used or not. So that way, we know for sure that this is not colliding. And uh, most likely, since we are using timestamp and all of this um, different thing, it will not collide. But if you want to make sure that this is colliding or not, you can just use radius. And it will never cross, um, as we already discussed, this will not cross a um, couple of GBs because even if you are using billions of keys, uh, it, it, it takes only 100 GB because uh, it, it, we are just using eight characters. So how do we generate this keys? To generate this keys, we need uh, a combination of three different parameters over here. So first one is uh, millisecond precision epoch time uh, that will consume about 41 uh, bits of your memory. And then the node ID. Uh, so the node IDs are the IDs which are uh, assigned to the uh, individual nodes of your distributed key generation service. Um, from there, you take 10 bits of it and then you need a local counter. A counter will be running in each of the distributed key generation server service to make these keys much randomized. So the counter will be running from 0 to 4,000, uh, um, whatever that, 48 or whatever, that is equal to um, 2 to the power of 12. Okay, so 2 to the power of 12 is equal to whatever the number. I don't remember it right now. So until then the counter will also be running uh, running and every time you generate a key the counter will be incrementing so you make the combination of all of that and one bit is less uh, because to make it 64 bit uh, because you can't have 63 bits so so add one bit maybe you can use this for a future purpose for something else so to, in total you will get 64 bit which is always unique at any given point of time and this way you can generate a lot of keys whenever you need it so this is all about distributed key generation service.
The last thing we need to understand over here is how the data is expired or how each individual paste are expired after the expiration time. For that, you will need to have another service called cleanup uh, uh, asyn asynchronous service. And this service is uh, totally independent. And this is not going to talk to any of the service except the database itself. What happens to that service is basically this will keep on waking up every once in one hour or something like that and then keep on checking all the records in the database to check if there are any records whose expired time in the database is much lesser than the current time. If that time is lesser, that means that the, that particular paste is expired. What we can do is it can simply delete that particular row. Along with the deleting, deleting the record in the database, if it has a S3 link, then you can go back to block store uh, and delete a record from the block store as well. That way, uh, we will save a lot of money. Uh, if, we do, if we forget to delete that from the S3, S3 will be keep on charging for you as well. So we have to clean up there as well. I think I have covered all of the scenarios you need to understand for the pastebin service. Um, yeah, if you like this video, please hit a like button. And if you have any questions, please comment. I'll try to answer in my free time. And I'll try to leave the system design diagram in the description. Um, thank you.